code. I, Moroni, to finish the record of my father Mormon. Therefore I will write and hide up the records in the earth. And whither I go, it mattereth not. For I am alone. My father hath been slain in battle, and all my kinsfolk, and I have not friends, know whither to go. Over 400 years have passed away since the coming of our Lord and Savior. Now I make not myself known to the Lamanites, for they put to death every Nephite that will not deny the Christ. And I will not deny the Christ. Wherefore I wander, whithersoever I can, for the safety of mine own life. And blessed be he that shall bring this record to light, for it shall be brought out of darkness unto light, and it shall be done by the power of God. I speak unto you as if ye were present, and yet ye are not. But behold, Jesus Christ hath shown you unto me, and I know your doing. And I would exhort you that ye would come unto Christ and be perfected in him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength. Then is his grace sufficient for you. And now I bid unto all farewell. I soon go to rest in the paradise of God until my spirit and body shall again reunite and I am brought forth triumphant through the air to meet you before the pleasing bar of the great Jehovah the eternal judge of both quick and dead. Amen. In 1827, an event prophesied for centuries took place in western New York State. Its coming had been prayed for by numerous ancient Christians. Its occurrence had been spoken of by Jesus Christ himself. It was the coming forth of one of the most important messages ever prepared by God for man. Nearly all of its contents have been carefully written over a period of centuries by prophets of God who were personal witnesses of Jesus Christ. Prophets who had been visited and tutored by angels and translated beings. Their writings were compiled and condensed, and the resulting record was revealed in the 19th century by an angel of God. It was on the evening of September 21st, 1823, Moroni, 
an ancient American prophet, appeared as a resurrected messenger sent from the presence of God to deliver a message to a young man named Joseph Smith. He said there was a book deposited, written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from whence they sprang. He also said that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it, as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants. Four years of preparation followed. Then, during the early hours of September 22nd, 1827, Joseph left his father's home in rural Manchester and traveled two miles to a nearby hill. Here, by divine appointment, the sacred record passed from immortal to mortal hands. The work of translation, a miracle, wrought by the gift and power of God, commenced in a small three-room dwelling in Harmony, Pennsylvania, and culminated in the log home of Peter Whitmer, Sr., near Fayette, New York. And now, after centuries of effort and sacrifice, we are the recipients of a priceless spiritual treasure. I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. And a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. The Lord has been operating for centuries to prepare the way for the coming forth of that book from the bowels of the earth to be published to the world, to show to the inhabitants thereof that he still lives and that he will, in the latter days, gather his elect from the four corners of the earth. The Book of Mormon cost the best blood of the 19th century. Many years ago, a young man gave up all he possessed in a search for truth that finally led him to the Book of Mormon. His name was Parley P. Pratt. In the spring of 1830, I was married and settled in a small home in the midst of a clearing made with my own hands near the Black River in Ohio. It was a beautiful, quiet place with a garden, thriving orchard, and fields of grain. About this time, my brother William, whom I had not seen for years, came to visit. My little brother, I am impressed. When we were together last, you had nothing. Now look at this. It would be difficult to leave it all. Leave it? Why? Past several months, the Holy Spirit has wrought so powerfully on me, I can't rest. The scriptures, William, the prophecies, you've read them. Important things are coming. I feel I have to devote my time to enlightening my fellow man and in warning them to prepare for the coming of the Lord. As a minister? No, I don't have any authority. I doubt anyone has. See, that's the great missing link, William, the authority to minister in holy things. But I feel duty-bound to enlighten mankind so far as God has enlightened me. If I had 50 acres of land, comfortable house, fields of grain, beautiful garden, fine orchard, I'm sure I would stay and enjoy it while I lived. The world might go on its merry way for all I care. You've toiled for years to obtain this. Why not enjoy it? Whoever shall forsake houses and lands for my sake shall receive an hundredfold and life everlasting. Are those the words of Jesus Christ? I believe the Bible partly. I wouldn't dare believe it literally. I feel called upon by the Holy Ghost to forsake my house and home for the gospel's sake. I plan to rely on the Lord's promises. If you think they are false, 
if I'm sustained, they are true. Godspeed, brother. We parted. He to his business, I to my preparations for a mission which would only end with my life. In August 1830, I sold my farm, completed my arrangements, and we bid adieu to our wilderness home, never to see it afterwards. I thought you'd gone to bed. I had. And then I discovered I was missing a husband. I need to leave the boat and stop a while in this region. Why? I don't know. But the spirit has plainly manifest that much to me. Go to our friends in Albany. And I'll come soon. How soon? I'm not sure. I have something to do here in this region. Exactly what or how long it will take me, I just don't know. But I'll come when it's finished. I took leave of her and of the boat and early the next morning walked ten miles into the country. Good day, sir. Well, good morning to you, stranger. I stopped to breakfast with a Mr. Wells and proposed to preach in the evening. He kindly accompanied me through the neighborhood to visit the people and circulate the appointment. A Baptist deacon, the name of Hanlon. He's a good soul. <laughs> sit, sit, Isaac. How are you, Thomas? Fine. Isaac, this is Mr. Pratt from Ohio. He's on his way to Albany. Albany? You're a bit off the beaten path, aren't you, boy? Mr. Pratt is a preacher of sorts. In fact, he will be preaching at my home this evening. You'll join us, won't you? Do you preach the scriptures, young man? I do. Good. I'll be there. Seven o'clock. We'll be looking for you. Mr. Pratt, are your views of the scriptures broad enough to accept such things as visions and the ministering of angels? They are. Come, sit. What is it, Isaac? Last week, I came across a book, a strange book, published down in Palmyra, said to have been originally written on plates of brass or gold by a branch of the tribes of Israel, and discovered and translated by a young man by the aid of heaven. There's even been talk of the ministering of angels. This book, do you have one? Loaned it to my sister. She'll be returning it in the morning, though, if you care to stop by. I will, if it's agreeable. I felt a strange interest in that book. The next morning, I called at his house where for the first time my eyes beheld the Book of Mormon. That book of books. The door's open. It's there on the table. Help yourself. I opened it with eagerness and read its title page. I 
then read the testimony of several witnesses in relation to the manner of its being found and translated. I commenced its contents by course. I read all day. Care for some supper, Mr. Pratt? Eating was a burden. I had no desire for food. Sleep was a burden when the night came, for I preferred reading to sleep. As I read, the Spirit of the Lord was upon me, and I knew and comprehended that the book was true, as plainly and manifestly as a man comprehends and knows that he exists. Do you know what's in this book? I haven't been able to hold on to it long enough to find out. I don't know how to thank you. My joy was now full, and I rejoiced sufficiently to more than pay me for all the sorrows, sacrifices, and toils of my life. I'm on my way to Palmyra. My book! I soon determined to see the young man who had been the instrument of its discovery and translation. I accordingly visited the village of Palmyra, and inquired for the residence of a Mr. Joseph Smith. Thank you very much. I found it some two or three miles from the village, near the close of day. Evening. Howdy. I'm looking for Mr. Joseph Smith. Translator of the Book of Mormon. Well, he lives in Pennsylvania now. It's about 100 miles from here. I'd be pleased to speak with his father or any member of the family. Well, his father's away on a journey right now, but this is his home, and I'm his brother. Pleased to meet you. My name is Pratt, Parley Pratt. Mr. Pratt, Hiram Smith. I informed him of the interest I felt in the book and of my desire to learn more about it. He welcomed me to his house. And since neither of us felt disposed to sleep, we conversed most of the night. This kingdom should be conducted in the last days. These meetings took place every year for four years, until finally, when he was sufficiently prepared, the Lord entrusted him with the plates. Joseph said that a messenger descended in a cloud of light. When did this happen? The 15th of May to be. This is a new dispensation, Mr. Pratt. A new commission. Angels have visited the earth. Authority has been restored. And Israel is being gathered a final time in preparation for the second coming of the Lord. How far to your next appointment? About 30 miles. But I'll return when it's finished. Oh, please do. We'd be glad to have you. Uh, could you use this? Please, take it. It's a token of our friendship. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a safe trip. I traveled on a few miles, and stopping to rest, I commenced again to read the book. To my great joy, I found that Jesus Christ, in his glorified, resurrected body, had appeared to the ancient inhabitants of the American continent, that he had taught them his gospel and healed their sick, and that many of his teachings had been preserved here, in this book, 
in purity. I esteemed this book, or the information contained in it, more than all the riches of the world. Yes, I verily believe that I would not at that time have exchanged the knowledge I then possessed for a legal title to all the beautiful farms, houses, villages, and property which passed in review before me on my journey through one of the most flourishing settlements of western New York. Such was the Book of Mormon. Let us take the Book of Mormon, which a man took and hid in his field, securing it by his faith, to spring up in the last days. Let us behold it coming forth out of the ground, branching forth, yea, even towering with lofty branches and godlike majesty. It is truth, and it has sprouted and come forth out of the earth, and God is sending down his powers, gifts, and angels to lodge in the branches thereof. In another time, in another corner of the world, another soul is reached by the influence of the Book of Mormon. This is the true story of Vincenzo di Francesca. September 23rd, 1888, in the town of Crateri in northern Sicily. From my earliest years, I was religiously inclined. And at age nine, my grandfather enrolled me in private religious training, where I studied the Old and the New Testaments. <laughs> E beve l'acqua vera nella fossa. L'acqua cosa avendo veduto tutto il popolo, si postò a balcone e disse, Il Signore è sì. Dio. Giuseppe Francesco e San e Vincenzo, He has a gift. Io, disse loro, il pastore è il guanto di apprezzo di suo progresso. At uh, the age of 12, I was admitted to the Gymnasium Le Clerical, a high school established by a Protestant religious order, where I studied religion for four and a half more years. Meanwhile, my brother Antonio invited me to uh, spend my seminary vacation in America. So, at uh, 17 years of age, I sailed from Naples, arriving in New York on October 12, 1905. Brothers and sisters, this is Vincenzo di Francesca. There, I met a friend of my brother, Ariel de Bellion, a pastor of the Italian branch of one of the Protestant churches, who engaged in me as a teacher to serve members of his congregation. He was so impressed with my gift in reading the scriptures that he suggested I attend Knox College in New York City. I followed his advice and received my degree as pastor with honors in November 
As I think back over the events of my life leading up to a cold morning in February 1910, I cannot escape the feeling that God had been mindful of my existence. Astori. Astori. Emilio, uh, come in. The signore, he is here. He asks that you come to his hall. He has some matters to discuss uh, about the parish. Put my money in here so you can keep your hands warm. Why so early, Vincenzo? Reverendo is ill. I go to his house to cheer him up, see if I can help. Beato se tu. I'm grateful for your help during my illness. At the parish house, I gave some words of comfort to Reverend Scarillo and agreed to the services he requested of me during his illness. As I walked back to my own lodgings, my mind dwelt on the book in my hand and the strange names I had seen on its pages. by the strength of their testimony. But there was no other clue to the book's identity. Ce la vede dell'aspirina? Sì, è proprio l'accio. Grazie. Buongiorno, Vincenzo. Come va? Bene, bene. Alcol de naturato, ce l'ha? Sì. E che altro? 
там и плоды колтона. cleaned the soiled pages. Then for several hours I read what was written in the book. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, said many things unto my brethren, insomuch that they were confounded. And they did go forth with me. And we did work timbers of curious workmanship. And the Lord did show me from time to time after what manner I should build the ship. Now I, Nephi, did not build the ship after the manner of men, but I did build it after the manner which the Lord had shown unto me. And it came to pass that after I had finished the ship, According to the word of the Lord, my father and brethren beheld that it was good, and that the workmanship thereof was exceedingly fine. Wherefore my brethren did humble themselves again before the Lord. And it came to pass that the voice of the Lord came unto my father, that we should arise and go down into the ship. And it came to pass that they went in search of the flocks, and they did follow Ammon, and they rushed forth with much swiftness, and did head the flocks of the king and did gather them together again to the place of water. Rabana, the king desires thee to stay. What desirest thou? Who art thou? Tell me by what power ye slew those who scattered my flocks. Believest thou that there is a God? I do not know what that means. Believest thou in a great spirit? This is God. Art thou sent from God? I am a man. 
But I am called by his Holy Spirit to teach these things unto this people. And a portion of his Spirit dwells in me, which gives me knowledge and also power. Now when Ammon had said these words, he began at the creation of the world and laid before them the holy scriptures. But this is not all, for he expounded unto them the plan of redemption, which was prepared from the foundation of the world. And he also made known unto them concerning the coming of Christ. And the king believed all his words. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified shall come into the world. Come forth, that ye may thrust your hands into my side, that ye may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet that ye may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth and have been slain for the sins of the world. Next day, I locked my door, and after reviewing the tenth chapter of Moroni, I knelt with the book in my hand. I then asked the Eternal Father, in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, to tell me if the book was of God. As I prayed, I felt my body becoming cold. Then my heart began to pound as if it would speak, and a feeling of warmth and gladness came over me and filled me with such joy that I cannot find words to express. I knew that the book came from God. How, then, does one best serve God? Through hollow ritual and the recital of road to prayers? Near the end of his life, an ancient prophet and king gave the answer, the key, as to how one can best serve God. These are his words. And behold, I tell you these things, that ye may learn the wisdom, that ye may learn that when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God. Serving, helping one another. Angelo. Where is that scripture found? It's in the Old Testament. 
somewhere. And it came to pass that I saw the heavens open, and an angel came down and stood before me. And he said unto me, What beholdest thou? And I said unto him, A virgin, most beautiful and fair above all other virgins. And the angel spoke to him again, saying, Behold, the virgin whom thou seest is the mother of the Son of God, after the manner of the flesh. Six hundred years before the birth of Christ, a prophet in a remote corner of the world was receiving detailed information concerning his birth, his life, his mission. Such was the vast importance of the coming of the Savior into the world. Pastore di Francesca. Pastore Vincenzo di Francesca has been ordered before the Committee of Censure on this, the third day of January 1912, to answer charges of heretical preaching and the promotion of disharmony among the pastoral brotherhood. It has been a... Vincenzo, they tell me you have a book from which you are preaching new doctrine. I have, Reverendo. And what is the name of this book? Its name had long since been worn from the catalog when I found it, and the title page was missing. I do not know the name of it. No matter. The book has been the source of trouble and disharmony to the brother. The attendance at your colleague's sermons has been dwindling. While I could hardly find a seat at your service last week. Such sensationalism and inequality is disruptive to the peace of the Brotherhood. Quite so, Vincenzo. The Council is determined that for the good of the Brotherhood, and for your good, you must burn the book. I find the book precisely in harmony with the writings of the prophets. Its words testify that the book is of the God whom we profess to adore. It speaks of the appearance of our Redeemer after his crucifixion to a remote people organized into a nation upon this continent. And the Savior himself there organized a church with apostles and priesthood just like he had done during his ministry among the Jews. It is better, rather than burning the book, that we practice what is in it, because certainly it gives us more light and knowledge than we now have. Vincenzo, I cannot burn the book, because I fear God. I have asked him if it is true, and my prayers have been answered affirmatively, positively without a shade of doubt. I feel it in my whole heart, mind, and body at this instant. That book which oppresses you must be burned, or you will incur the most serious displeasure. I repeat, I will not burn the book. I prefer to go out of the ministry rather than burn the book. In April of 1914, this heavy conflict had its conclusion before the Council of Peace of the sect, and I was invited to a conciliation. Mm. 
Strange heads. Please, sit down. When this matter was previously heard, there were sharp words from the committee members, which may have provoked you. But this is most regrettable. So today we seek a reconciliation. We all have a great love for you, Vincenzo, and are mindful of the valuable assistance you've always given us so freely. However, you must remember that obedience, complete and absolute, is the rule. You have continued to preach falsehoods, but now the long suffering of our members has come to an end. You must burn the book. Musicians have changed. The music is still the same. That I must destroy the book with fire without anyone examining its contents. I would be pleased, my brothers, if you would read it, pray about it, as I have done. You must be noble. Noble enough to destroy this vessel of falsehoods, which has brought so much bitterness to our fold. I look forward with joy to the time when the church to which the book belongs will be made known to me. And I will become a member of it. Vincenzo. Repent of your stubbornness. If I burn this book, I will offend God. Council has been more than forbearing. Pastore Vincenzo di Francesca, having attempted reconciliation and finding you unwilling to abide by the order of this council, we declare your credentials invalid and strip you of your degree of pastor and of every right and privilege in the church. You are hereafter classed as a rebel against the ordinances of the sect and are removed from the body of the church. The matter is closed. Despite the painful separation, I left with a feeling of peace at having defended my cause and that of the book of the unknown name. On November 26, 1914, the Italian consulate of New York called me to embark for Italy as a soldier in the 127th Infantry, stationed at Florence. In May 1915, I was sent to the front. There, I experienced all of the sadness and suffering associated with the battles of World War I. But I remembered the lessons of the book I had read. We will fight it by ourselves. It is told by a prophet named Alma. Di Francesca, the chaplain tells me you have an unusual loyalty to a book with no name. What is this book? I found it five years ago in New York City. Who published it? I do not know. Tell me the story you related to the men the other night. In the commissary? It is an experience recorded by a prophet, Alma, in the 24th chapter of his works. Many centuries ago, on the American continent, a kingdom of bloodthirsty warriors underwent a miraculous change of heart. They were converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
Ever after, they refused to take up arms against their attackers. In fact, they buried their weapons deep in the earth. Rather than shed the blood of their brethren, they would give up their own lives. When their attackers saw this, that they would not flee, but would lie down and perish, praising God in the very act, their hearts were touched, and they threw down their weapons. And that day the people of God were joined by more than a thousand souls. Do you intend to keep this book? I do. Ten days confinement, with the order that you speak no more of this nameless book and its stories. After the war, I returned to New York City, where I met an old friend who was a pastor of my former church and who knew the history of my troubles. He felt I had been unfairly dealt with, and he began interceding for me with members of the Synod. I was finally admitted to the congregation as a lay member. As an experiment, it was agreed that I should accompany my pastor friend on a mission to Australia. In Sydney, we met some Italian immigrants who had serious questions about certain gospel translations in various editions of the Bible. My minister friend was unable to satisfy them and referred them to me. I understand your concerns. There are errors in translation, but through the grace of God, there are other sources, in addition to the Bible, from which we can learn the words of the Savior. Other sources? Verse 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Who are these other sheep? Shortly after the Savior's resurrection and ascension in the Eastern Hemisphere, he appeared in the Western Hemisphere to the inhabitants of the ancient Americas. But where have you learned of this? I have a book which contains the words the Savior preached to these people. He healed their sick, performed miracles, preached his gospel exactly as he had done in the Palestine. This knowledge was sweet for them, but very bitter for my colleague. At first, he bore with me. But I could not resist the strong urge to preach the divine truth. And finally, he denounced me in his report. Again, the Synod put in force their previous judgment, and I was forever out of the sect. Soon after, I returned to Italy. In May 1930, while seeking for some information in a French dictionary, I stumbled onto the source of my precious book. I read the words carefully and found that a Mormon church had been established in 1830 and that this church operated a university at Provo, Utah. I quickly wrote to the president of the university and asked for information about the remainder of the book that talks of Nephi, Alma, and Mosiah. 
He passed my letter to the President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And in another month, I heard from President Heber J. Grant. He sent me a copy of the Book of Mormon in Italian and said that he had informed the President of the European Missions in Liverpool, England, Elder John A. Whitsell, to arrange baptism. June 5th, 1932, Elder John A. Whitsaw of the Council of the Twelve came to Lakewoods intending to baptize me for the revolution between factions on the island of Sicily caused the police of Palermo to prevent me from going to Lakewoods. And I had to wait for another chance, like Moses, in anticipation of the promised land. I was called to arms during the Italian-Ethiopian War in 1934, and this further prevented anyone with authority from reaching me for baptism. After the war, my name was placed on the mailing list of the Millennial Star, and in 1937 I started correspondence with President Hugh B. Brown of the British Mission. He wrote to me saying that he would be in Rome on a certain day and I could meet him there and be baptized. However, his letter of invitation for me to go to Rome was delayed until the day in which he left for America because of the outbreak of World War II. At that time, all missionaries in Europe returned to America. Thus, I was deprived of baptism and cut off from any news of the church. I remained a faithful follower and fervent preacher of the gospel of this dispensation. I had copies of the standard works, and I translated chapters into Italian and sent them to persons of my acquaintance. Dear Elder Wizzo, my purpose in writing is to ask you to please help me to be baptized soon. My greatest desire is to receive this essential ordinance from an authorized servant of God. Elder Witzo answered, saying that he had asked President Samuel E. Bringhurst of the Swiss-Austrian mission to come down to Sicily and baptize me.
Vincenzo di Francesca. Having been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. salvation in the kingdom of God, which was spoken of in the remainder of the pages of the book without name or title page. Surely man does not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. To all the saints in Zion, I clasp hands across the ocean in true brotherhood. This is the Hill Cumorah, located in western New York State, near the village of Palmyra. The date, September 22, 1827. The prophet Joseph Smith has come here under direction of an angel of God to receive a book written upon gold plates. Joseph had come here many times before, had seen the plates, and been instructed by the angel named Moroni. This is the true story of Joseph Smith's valiant mission in bringing forth the Book of Mormon. of God. My name is Moroni. God has a work for you, Joseph, and because of it, your name shall be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds, and tongues. There is a book deposited, written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from whence they sprang. Contained within it is the fullness of the everlasting gospel as delivered by the Savior to these ancient inhabitants. Your work is to translate these ancient writings and to bring them forth to the world. You see which way it went? 
No, let's keep going. <laughs> As soon as Joseph had the plates in his possession, he was hounded continually by mobs of gold-greedy people. This caused Joseph much anxiety in protecting the plates. <laughs> There's got to be a good reason why Joseph can't show him to us. After all, we're his family. If he showed me, I wouldn't tell anybody for any reason. Even if I gave you one of those new dolls? Only if he promised not to tell anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how much those plates are worth. If I had that much gold, I know what I'd do with it. I'd buy a big mansion in Virginia, a carriage with white horses and lots of fancy clothes. You better not let Joseph hear you talking like that. Well, I heard you. And there'll be no such talk in this house. I was only pretending. It's that kind of pretending that causes trouble. Greedy people dreaming of easy wealth. Just remember, young lady, the real treasure is not the gold in those plates, but what's written on them. Now, Catherine, you get off to your own room. And the rest of you, go to sleep. Come on, Lucy. I sure would like to know what's written on those plates, all that valuable stuff they keep talking about. Oh, there you are. It would take me days to tell you all the wonderful things engraved on those plates. The people came from Jerusalem and were directed by the Lord to the Americas. For over a thousand years they lived here, building great cities and pyramids and having terrible wars. But when they would listen, Heavenly Father would help them solve their problems, teach them to live in peace and to pray, have faith, and to know the purpose of their lives. But there is still one story in the Book of Mormon more beautiful and more wonderful than all the others. It is the story of Jesus and his visit to the ancient Americas after his resurrection over 1,700 years ago. Jesus dwelt among the people, healed their sick and their lame, blessed the little children. 
And then he invited the people to come and feel the prints of the nails in his hands and the wound in his side. And that, Catherine, is what makes the plate so valuable. The testimony of thousands of people on this continent who saw with their own eyes and felt with their own hands and testified that truly Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Joseph, is this where you saw Heavenly Father and Jesus? Yes, Lucy. This is the very place. Because of the mob's severe and unrelenting persecution in Palmyra, Joseph's work on the Book of Mormon stopped completely. During the winter of 1827, he was forced to move to Harmony, Pennsylvania, in hopes of completing the translation there. His wife Emma and her brother Alva would travel with him. What in tarnation you got in that thing? It looks like it weighs a ton. Well, I guess some beans are just heavier than others. Will. We'll leave it in his hands. Sorry for the inconvenience, ma'am, but uh, Sheriff White here has certain matters to take up with your husband. Now, just where do you think you're going? You came to search our wagon, didn't you? Wait a minute. How do we know there ain't something hidden in the bottom of this barrel? Interesting thought, Everett. Why don't you roll that thing off and bust it open? Not on your life. Sheriff, this whole thing's gone far enough. Now, nobody's touching those beans. Well, will you look at that? I think maybe we found what we're after. Sheriff, if you allow these men to crack it open, I'll expect $10, payment in full. He's trying to hide something, Sheriff. It's as plain as the nose on his face. Alva, hand me that bucket. I'll gladly scoop every last bean out with my hands at no extra charge. Ah, forget it. We're wasting our time. Come on, let's go. You ain't getting away with this, Joe Smith. Right thinking people will pull you down yet, you and your stories. Come on, men. In the spring of 1828, Martin Harris came to Harmony. Joseph, it's Martin. Martin was to be Joseph's scribe. Martin. Hello, Joseph. Good to see you. Good to see you. I came as soon as I Thank could. Thank you for coming. They worked hard and soon completed 116 pages. But Martin wanted to take these pages and show them to his skeptical wife, Lucy, who had ridiculed him for working with Joseph. Joseph, I beg of you, ask the Lord one more time, please. Martin, without a doubt, you are the most persistent man I've ever known. But if I could have the manuscript for, for just a short time, if I could show it to Lucy, then she might give me some peace. How can I ask the Lord again? I've already asked him twice, and twice the answer has been no. I think I'm crazy, Joseph, devoting all my time and, and money on you. Would it hurt, Joseph, to ask the Lord one more time? Is it true, Joseph? Yes, Martin. The Lord has given permission. But only on condition that you bind yourself to a solemn oath. Anything the Lord asks, Joseph. Under no condition will you show this manuscript to anyone. 
except your wife and a few close relatives. If these writings are lost or fall into evil hands, whatever the reason, as surely as God lives, we will both reap the penalty and face condemnation. Put your mind at peace, Joseph. I will honor the oath with my life. And before the week is out, I will have the manuscript back in your hands. That is my solemn promise. But the week went by, and Martin didn't return. Anxious days passed. Then Emma convinced Joseph to make the long journey back to Palmyra and find out what had happened to Martin and the manuscript. Joseph? Heaven's name. Oh. Uh, why don't you carry this, Don Carlos? Thank you. Hello, Lucy. Mother. What's wrong, son? He hasn't slept all night. He walked 20 miles from where the coach left him. No, it's something else. You look unwell. What is it? I'm all right, Mother. And very glad to see all of you. Don Carlos, get on old Dolly and ride to Palmyra. Tell Mr. Harris I want to see him at once. Hurry. Run along, Lucy. Please tell me. What's wrong? He seemed pretty anxious to see you, Mr. Harris. I can imagine. I should have gone back when I said I would. But I just couldn't break away with all these problems on the farm. What's that, sir? Oh, never mind. Go and tell Joseph I'll be right over. And save some breakfast for me. You haven't lost that manuscript, have you? Martin, answer me. Yes, Joseph, I've lost the manuscript and I have broken my oath. No, it can't be. You've got to go back and find that manuscript. You've got to go back. It's no use, Joseph. I I've torn the house apart from one end to the other. There's just no place left to look. Everything is gone. Didn't I tell you this would bring condemnation upon our heads? Didn't I say that? Yes, Joseph, you did. Oh. I should have listened. I should have listened to the Lord. Joseph was devastated. He was facing one of the darkest periods of his life. Moroni took the plates back, and all work on the Book of Mormon stopped. Months went by, and only after much repenting and praying did the Lord reveal his will. The plates would be returned, but Joseph was to find a new scribe. The lost section was not to be retranslated. Although Joseph had to face many more hardships, in due time and with the Lord's help, the Book of Mormon was published on March 26, 1830. It stands to this day as a second witness for our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ.
This is Richmond, Missouri, an ordinary-looking American town, outside of which is an equally ordinary-looking monument. But back of this granite shaft lies a story that holds great significance for every person on this earth. This monument was raised in honor of three men who claimed to be eyewitnesses to one of the most controversial events in modern history. This is their story as they told it. The year is 1881. Morning, George. Anything for me today worth delivering? Don't know about that, David. I just deliver. Don't have time to read them. <laughs> I want to uh, congratulate you, Mr. Whitmer. Congratulate? For getting three letters in one day? No, for finally coming to your senses about that golden Bible story. What do you mean? Don't take me wrong now. We've always liked you. The whole town likes you. But it has made you look just a little peculiar to hang to that story about the angel. I'm glad we don't have to wonder about that now. What do you mean now? What is it you're driving at? Well, the whole town will know pretty soon how you came out and told John Murphy over in Polo that there weren't any golden plates with writings on them. That it was all a story. Murphy said I told him that. He did. I talked to him myself. But I never said that. Well, that's the story that's going around. And my advice is just to let it be. George, this story I can't let be. Suit yourself. Morning to you, David. Come on, Rosie. <laughs> David, how are you? Not well, Alexander. I need your help. Oh, what's the matter? Someone stole one of your horses? Worse. Somebody's trying to steal my good name. Your good name? <laughs> that would be pretty hard to do. I want 20 signatures on this affidavit. Will you be the first to sign? We, the undersigned citizens of Richmond, Ray County, Missouri, where David Whitmer, Sr. has resided since the year A.D. 1838, certify that we have been long and intimately acquainted with him and know him to be a man of the highest integrity and of undoubted truth and veracity. Will you sign it? I don't understand it, David. Who would question your integrity? And you, a former mayor of this town. Never mind. Would you be willing to testify that I am an honest man? Of course, David. There's no doubt in my mind concerning your honesty. Thank you. It's important, Alexander. My eternal peace rests on it. This affidavit will appear in the Richmond Conservator next week, along with this statement uh, by me. And to all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, it having been represented by one 
John Murphy of Polo, Caldwell County, Missouri, that I, in a conversation with him last summer, denied my testimony as one of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon. To the end, therefore, that he may understand me now, if he did not then, and that the world may know the truth, I wish now, standing as it were in the very sunset of life and in the fear of God, once and for all, to make this public statement that I never have at any time denied that testimony or any part thereof which has so long since been published with that book as one of the three witnesses. I do again affirm the truth of all my statements as then made and published. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. It was no delusion. What is written is written, and he that readeth, let him understand. I don't understand you Mormons. It was the same way with Joseph. I couldn't get near him without starting to believe the things he said. That's not hard to explain, Alexander. The things he said were true. Well, I defended him in the courtroom time and time again. He never gave me reason not to believe him. Once, as a general, I refused to obey an illegal order to execute him. Joseph Smith, an amazing man. He was more than that. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. And the book he translated is the word of God, just as surely as the Bible is. Now that all this time has passed, David, now that Joseph Smith's been dead for nearly 40 years, do you really feel as strongly as you once did about Joseph and the Book of Mormon? I most assuredly do. I've never heard the whole story about you and the other two men seeing the golden plates. And rumor seldom comes close to the truth. Do you have time, David, to tell me about it? Well, if you have time to listen. It's a strange story but I testify that it's the truth. It was the year 1829. I was a young man when I met the prophet Joseph. I first learned of him through another of the three witnesses, Oliver Cowdery, who later became my brother-in-law. Oliver had come to know the Smiths while boarding with them as a school teacher. And when he met Joseph, Oliver became devoted to him. So did I. Joseph was a man that, well, a man that was unusual. You knew that right off. I hope now we can publish the book soon. It contains the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, something the world has almost lost. However long the book takes, you're welcome to stay at our home until it's done. Thank you, David. I knew you would come when Oliver sent for you. With all the persecution here in Pennsylvania, it's been impossible for Joseph to complete the translation of the plates. And you found these plates buried in a hillside? I didn't really find them. I was directed there by the angel Moroni, who was a prophet on this continent over a thousand years ago. His father, Mormon, compiled and condensed the record. Can I see the plates? The Lord has made known to me that he will call special witnesses. To these men, he will show the plates, and they must testify along with me. But at present, I've been commanded to show them to no one.
At my father's home in Fayette, New York, the work progressed rapidly. Joseph dictated his translation of the plates to Oliver, who served as scribe. And when ye shall receive these things, I would exhort you that ye would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true, and if ye shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent... Joseph and Oliver worked diligently, and within a month, the book was completed. Still, Joseph had not shown the plates to us, and he then delivered them back to the angel Moroni. Soon after that came the day that none who were there will ever forget. Joseph had sent for his parents, whom he had not seen since he had begun the translation. They arrived with Martin Harris, a friend of the Smiths who had been interested in the work from the first. After our morning devotional, and this is consistent with the Lord's plan, for, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Martin Harris, you have got to humble yourself before God this day that you may obtain a forgiveness of your sins. If you do, it is the will of God that you should look upon the plates in company with Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer. then prepared ourselves to call upon Almighty God that we should receive the manifestation he had promised. Joseph prayed first, then each of us in turn, but we received no answer. We again observed the same order of prayer, but with the same result as before. And we pray that despite our weaknesses, thou wilt be merciful unto us and grant us a knowledge of that wonderful thing that thou hast done in bringing forth the Book of Mormon. We know that... I'm sorry. I can't. The Lord is silent because of me. We again called upon the Lord and were blessed with a marvelous manifestation. It was an angel of the Lord. We saw the plates of gold, and then we heard a voice saying, These plates have been revealed by the power of God, and they have been translated by the power of God. The translation of them, which you have seen, is correct. And I command you to bear record of what you now see and hear. We did bear record of that vision. Our names are signed to a statement of it that appears in every copy of the Book of Mormon. Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, Martin Harris. Martin Harris? Yes, Martin did humble himself and saw the plates and the angel later in the day, just as we had. But, David, if you really saw the things you've told me, why did you leave Joseph and the church he organized? You did leave, didn't you? Yes, I did. And so did Oliver and Martin for a time. But why? 
If, if what you said is true. About eight years after we saw the plates, there came a time of trial and great difficulty for the church, both from within and without. Persecution, money problems, jealousies, hurt, bitterness, pride, all took their toll. But that doesn't change the truth of our experience with the angel. None of us, Oliver, Martin, myself, ever denied our testimony of the Book of Mormon. David, as a lawyer, I'm amazed. Oh? How's that? You could find no better evidence than this. Each of you became personally disaffected from Joseph Smith. True, we did. And none of you ever tried to expose him as a fraud? None of you ever said, he deceived me. I was mistaken. There was no angel. There was no deception. Joseph was an honest man. In a court of law, one witness is enough to substantiate a claim. And you had three. I don't believe I ever knew Martin Harris. What became of him? Martin remained in Kirtland, Ohio for a long time. Later, he went to Utah and was rebaptized into the church. Just a few years ago, when Martin was 92, he was taken seriously ill. Oh, Bishop Smith, come in. Thank you. How's your father? I'm afraid he's worse. Would you like to see him? Perhaps I shouldn't disturb him. No, it will do him good. Sister Harris. Hello, Bishop. I'm so glad you came. Brother Martin, how are you? Bishop, I'm dying. Nah, you'll be up and around in no time. No, my time is short. There's something that you'll be glad to know, Brother Martin. It's about the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon? Yes. It's going to be translated and published in Spanish. Wonderful, Bishop. Wonderful. I was there, you know. I saw the plates and the angel. Try to rest, Father. Oh. I will very soon now, and with a conscience void of offense toward men, our God. And now I charge you to continue bearing my witness to the world. As surely as I see that sun shining through that window, as surely as I see you before me, I saw the angel who showed us the plates of gold. The Book of Mormon is true. I know what I know. I've seen what I've seen and heard what I've heard. And that was Martin's last testimony. Hmm. A man's last words can usually be taken as truth. And Oliver, I knew him for a short while. He began practicing law, didn't he? Yes, he came here to see me in 1850, and he told me what had since happened to him. Ah, uh, this will interest you, Alexander, being a lawyer. Oliver had been assigned as attorney for the prosecution in a trial. You have heard the evidence, my fellow citizens, and I am confident that you will see justice done. Our society cannot exist on lawlessness, on dishonesty, on fraud. When a law is broken, a penalty must be paid. Gentlemen, the prosecution rests.
may it please the court and the gentlemen of the jury, we have just listened to a statement by one Oliver Cowdery. He's told us a great deal about honesty. It's very interesting. Very interesting indeed to discover that this same Oliver Cowdery was a party to one of the greatest frauds ever perpetrated upon the American people. Your Honor, I object. This is entirely irrelevant. On the contrary, it is quite relevant. As the prosecution is so roundly condemning the dishonesty, the criminal act of the defendant has not the jury the right to know the character of the one seeking judgment? Your Honor, I object. <clears throat> Objection overruled. Look, the Mormon Bible, one of the greatest hoaxes the world has known, and in it, swearing that the book is true, is the signature of the man sitting before this court, Oliver Cowdery. This is the man who has testified and written that he beheld an angel of God, that the angel showed him the plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated. Let's have some quiet here. Quiet! Well, now, it's quite possible there could be more than one Oliver Cowdery, you know. Then surely he'll want to clear this up. Cowdery? May I? We declare with words of soberness that an angel of God came down from heaven and laid before our eyes the plates and the engravings thereon. The voice of the Lord commanded that we should bear record of it. Wherefore, we bear testimony of these things. I am that Oliver Cowdery. Whatever my faults and weaknesses might be, this testimony which I have written and given to the world is literally true. What I have there said that I saw, I know that I saw. Even at the expense of ridicule, Oliver could not deny what he knew to be true. And then, after ten years of being apart from the church, he decided to return. Oliver and his family arrived at Council Bluffs as the Mormons were preparing to go west. A conference of the church was in progress, and Orson Hyde was presiding. We must walk in the true channel if we are to avoid the sandbox. Each and every one of us must. Excuse me one minute, brothers and sisters. Oliver. Uh, I... Sister Cowdery, won't you be seated? Come up on the stand with me, Oliver. That's Oliver Cowdery. Oliver Cowdery. My dear brothers and sisters, we are honored today at the sudden arrival of one who is known to many of you, I'm sure, and who will now address us. Brother Oliver Cowdery. Thank you, Brother Hyde. Friends and brethren, as you have heard, my name is Oliver Cowdery. In the early history of this church, I stood in her councils, not because I was better than other men, but to fulfill the purposes of God, he called me to a high and holy calling. I lost that calling. For a number of years, I have been separated from you. 
bow humbly. I desire to come back. I seek no station. I wish only to be identified with you. I wish to come in at the door. I know the door. I was the first man to be baptized by authority in this dispensation. And now I ask to be baptized again. I wrote with my own pen the entire Book of Mormon, save a few pages, as it fell from the lips of the prophet Joseph, as he translated it by the gift and power of God. I beheld with my eyes and handled with my hands the gold plates from which it was transcribed. I saw the glorious messenger who showed us these plates, and I heard the voice of the Lord declare that the work was true. I was present with Joseph when the holy priesthood was restored to this earth. That priesthood was conferred upon me, and I held it as a servant of God. I laid my hands upon that man's head. Yes, I laid my hands upon Brother Orson Hyde and conferred on him the priesthood. And he holds that priesthood now. I come to him, to all of you, asking to be restored to the body of the church. My brothers and sisters, I have a testimony of this work that I have never denied, though the world has caused me to suffer because of it. I know that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. To the end of his life, he was true to that calling. Oliver planned to go west with the church but while he was here in Richmond visiting with me, he was taken ill and died. His final words to me were a plea that, that I would be true to my testimony of the Book of Mormon. Oliver died a happy man, the happiest I ever saw. I'm the only one of the three left in this life. To their last breaths, the others were true to the calling we received from the Lord. And so will I be. No force on earth can make me deny what I know. Thank you again. David... I'd hate to be the lawyer assigned to challenge what you have told me. David Whitmer did get his signatures. 22 of the most prominent men in the area signed in defense of his character. When David Whitmer, the last of the three witnesses, died in January of 1888, one of the Richmond newspapers reviewed his connection with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and concluded, Skeptics may laugh and scoff if they will, but no man could listen to Mr. Whitmer as he talked of his interview with the angel of the Lord without being most forcibly convinced that he has heard an honest man tell what he honestly believes to be true. of the things I have both seen and heard. 
a record written by way of commandment, and also by the spirit of prophecy and revelation. And I call it the Book of Mormon. And now behold, I, Mormon, began to be old, and I finish my record concerning the destruction of my people, the Nephites. For it came to pass that we gathered in all our people to the land of Cumorah, and knowing it to be the last struggle of my people, and having been commanded of the Lord that I should not suffer the records that had been handed down by our fathers to be destroyed, I hid up all the records which had been entrusted to me, save it were these few plates which I gave my son, Moroni. And it came to pass that the Lamanites came to do battle against us. And they did fall upon my people with the sword, and with the bow, and with the arrow, and with the axe, and with all manner of weapons of war. And it came to pass that my men were hewn down, yea, even my ten thousand. And the ten thousand of my son, Moroni. And the ten thousand of Gidgadone. And Lema with his ten thousand. And Gilgal and his. Behold, I, Moroni, do finish the record of my father, Mormon, for he hath been slain in battle. He and all my kinfolk. Whether the Lamanites will slay me, I know not. For they put to death all who will not deny Christ. And I, Moroni, will not. Wherefore I am alone to wander the face of the land keeping safe this record of my people. What of this record? The record of Laban valued by Lehi above all his earthly wealth. What of this record to his children? Some hearkened like Nephi and were blessed. Laman and Lemuel did not and were cursed. What of this record? Recording words of prophecy to an angry king for which Abinadi forfeited his life. What of this record to the court of King Noah? Alma listened and was converted. King Noah died in flight by fire. What of this record? Testimonies engraved and bound in gold. A lifetime of gathering and abridging by Mormon, my father. What of this record? Offered as words of life to the Nephites. None listen. The nation was destroyed. What of this record? Now... That it is finished, written, and sealed up and hid up unto the Lord to come forth by the gift and power of God. What of this record? In your day, 